Uh, this is the OGM call for Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Uh, I will also turn on the captions. There we go. And um, this week is a check-in week. We've been messing around with our check-in <laughs> formats a bit. Um, uh, last week, Last week, I felt there was a confusion between which part of the check-in was check-in and which part of the check-in was general discussion. Yeah. I sort of lost the yeah. program on that. Yeah. But I liked our protocol. We were um, we were doing a nice job of bringing pauses in. And, and uh, Jenny, Jenny. We, one of the things that, that uh, we've discovered is that hastening through the conversation um, isn't quite as good as pausing a bit between when everybody steps in to take a turn and talk. Uh, and, it, and it's entirely up to them, up to them, you know, their discretion to um, how long the pause or whatever else. But um, that gives us all a little bit more time to process and sort of be with the conversation and stay there. Uh, we have a tiny bit of controversy about whether or not to use the chat during check-in. Uh, one mode of operation we have is to uh, basically say no chat during check-in and then OK chat during conversation. But again, that that funny boundary between check-ins and conversation, we don't, we haven't managed to manage all that well. Um, so I'm, I'm before we start sort of the round, I'm going to see if anybody has any suggestions or preferences on the protocol we use and how we shape it. Gil, um, hi everybody, and good to meet you, Jenny. Uh, I wasn't aware of a controversy over the check-in protocol. Um, so I'm I just sort of muddled ahead with using the chat during check-in because things come up in check-in that are, you know, that, that trigger associations or possible references and so forth. So I'm inclined to go that way, but I don't know what the other point of view is. Um, the other point of view is to treat the check-ins more like Quaker meeting uh, so that we get everybody's full attention, uh, which then means relenting uh, on the chat and not being... Uh, distracted or whatever it is to make the comments in the chat and then taking notes on a notepad or whatever if you want to mm -hmm. so that you can bring in what you're thinking about later mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to miss out on the comment it just doesn't need mm -hmm. to happen while everybody's checking in mm -hmm. and it's kind of about quality of attention things like that uh, Stacy yeah and I have a point of view which is against having a rule for that because I think it's good that we discussed, you know, why it's not good or why we feel a certain way. But then as grown adults, it's up to us how we want to conduct ourselves. So especially in a space that I'm coming to because I want to, not because I'm being paid to, I want that freedom to decide how I behave. I do think that grown adults thing is a little overrated, but still. Even <laughs> if I was a child, I still want that freedom. Yeah. I want to do it because it feels like the right thing to do not because I'm afraid or I'm being pushed. One of the interesting things about what's called vocal ministry in Quaker meeting, which is called silent meeting, is that every now and then you have to sort of stop the meeting and say, we're going to have a, a conversation about vocal ministry, uh, you know, after meeting sometime. And then and then um, the, the one that I remember, we had a, a member in Connecticut, at Wilton meeting, Wilton monthly meeting, whose name was John Lee. Uh, he was a retired engineer. And we get two thirds of the way through this vocal ministry conversation where you where you sort of relearn how to step in. And the fact that in Quaker meeting, it's not meant to be a conversation between messages during the meeting. It's meant to be uh, us ministering to uh, one another, et cetera, et cetera. And two thirds of the way through the meeting, he pipes in and goes, I know I talk too much. You know, and and he was the reason the meeting was called because he had a message every meeting. He was, he was pretty sort of chatty. Uh, and for Quakers, chatty is not what what would pass for chatty in Brooklyn. Like these are these are different levels of chatty entirely. Um, but he sort of he sort of confessed to understanding he might be the problem and promised to sort of behave better, et cetera. And it was a bit of a self regulating community building conversation where we learned the norms of how how you do what's called vocal ministry. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, the other thing I want to say is I think it's also up to the rest of the community. So if somebody's doing a lot, you know, if they're chatting to me. I can maybe like not answer or, you know, shape the behavior that way. And I think that's all of our responsibility to do. So I have a suggestion. Yes. Um, let's approach the check-in in, in the spirit of listening. And if people feel a need to comment, they can comment, but the spirit will be different than the usual part of the conversation. I want to see how it goes. Sounds good. 
There were four. Uh, and I would like to have a sharper marker this week between check-in and conversation, meaning uh, let's go once. Uh, we will each sort of pick our turn into the check-in by raising the electronic hand here so we can all kind of see who's in the queue. Um, mm -hmm. But let's all go just once until we've all checked in and uh, then we can be off to the races. Um, any other thoughts about process? And Jenny, by check-in, we we mean um, and welcome to the call. I'm glad you're glad you're here with us. Um, we kind of mean what's on your mind that is OGME in nature, or what have you been doing, or what questions are are, are you having, or whatever else. Um, in your case, we'd probably love to know a little bit about your your background um, into the into this group. Um, but that's it's kind of a it's a, a light uh, light kind of check-in, and we're, we're looking for, and and there's another thing I just realized, which is the nature of the question we're answering during check-in matters a lot. Uh, Doug Carmichael here, uh, there, there's a Doug protocol where uh, the question that we are uh, asking is, in fact, and let me get it proper, the, the fo focusing question for the Doug protocol is, what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation? And so everybody would address that question um, individually. And then at the at the marker where everybody's done a quick check-in, and the idea of the check-ins in the Doug protocol uh, is to have the check-ins be relatively quick, so that the so that the questions can be stated and put on the table, and then and then we pick from among the questions that are on the table what we're going to discuss for the rest of the session, um, which is also a, a a really interesting idea. So um, I'm, I'm confused. That sounds like a topic thing rather than a check-in thing. Um, mm -hmm. But we were using that as the as the protocol for um, check in calls because it was a form of check in. Um, we were using that as a protocol for starting a topic call. Well, we actually used it for check in. We uh, it, it was it was um, my you memory. Use it for a check in. But oh, I would call I... it a topic call. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Um, for for what it's worth, by the way, um, the the Pete that hasn't been to a bunch of these calls is feeling like this the the eight minutes so far has sounded like a uh, calvin ball we could also play calvin ball which means which i'm not complaining just, you know, everybody changes the rules as we go yeah. oh <laughs> that works yeah this is a calvin ball is from calvin and hobbs it's basically uh because calvin, calvin has such a fertile imagination he gets to change the rules so he wins all the time Calvin, Calvin being one of my heroes, my first my first online email address was spiff at panics.com. No, I think it was spiff at well.com because my hero was Spaceman Spiff, Conqueror of the Cosmos, one of Calvin's uh, fictitious characters. Um, so I'm going to suggest we start going into check-in, uh, not using the focusing question of serious conversations, but doing a more traditional OGM check-in. And let's go. Let's go. Take one turn. Um, uh, oh, nice! This is what I thought, Calvinist, I thought you'd like that, Jerry. It's a... what Calvinists <laughs> believe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the Church of Calvin. I really like it. For Calvinists, um, neo-Calvinism, maybe <laughs> a whole new angle on this thing. Uh, so let's go in the. <laughs> checking in, in in our old spirit of what's in your head or <coughs> has to do with um, open global mindish kind of things. And um, I will not step in between people so that uh, as you see the hands in the queue, <coughs> it is, I may step in to ask if anybody hasn't gone yet to raise your hand or you could do that. And please, before you step in, uh, take a pause. And with that, who would like to take us in? I'll go really quickly. Um, I was just interested out of curiosity to find out the difference, to find out where Socrates and Plato disagreed. And I was really surprised to find out that where they disagreed had to do with the written word and conversations, which is exactly what I'm interested in. And I wrote a little thing in the Plex this week. So that's my check-in. And I will be having a call, hosting a call on Tuesday to talk more about that and maybe go towards 
are we asking the right questions? <clears throat> so I'll go. Uh, one of the things that's been on my mind is what is happening to romantic <laughs> relationships under the shadow of climate change? <clears throat> I, I didn't catch this. Uh, what is happening to what? Romantic relationships. Oh, relationships. <clears throat> it was stimulated by a friend who was traveling in uh, Indonesia, <clears throat> no, in China, and uh, fell in love with a local person who fell in love with him. They barely shared a language. Uh, and the view was, as they tried to understand what had happened, that the vulnerability coming with the shadow of climate change made them much more vulnerable to new relationships. Um, <clears throat> flowing from that, I was, um, I took part in radio conversation yesterday, um, um, Ellen Orla Kane's show all together now with a guy named Andrew Boyd, who's just written a book or just about to publish a book called I Want a Better Catastrophe, um, and talking about optimism, <clears throat> has open <clears throat> Um, what people's, uh, you know, reaction and stances in relation to climate. Uh, and the, um, the apparent mood of the book is despair and surrender. Uh, but it's actually not. Um, so I'm in that conversation about how do we orient to huge looming messes coming at us? Uh, and what are the possible responses and appropriate responses to that? Shall I jump in? Please do. All right. Um, I'm new to the new to the group. My name is Jenny Quillian. I live in Amsterdam. Um, my entry. I'm a good friends with Hank Kuhn, who's part of this group. Uh, he's how I heard about Jerry. I've met Jerry once online. Um, <clears throat> the part of my background that made the connection is I'm pretty good at patterns. Um, so, in this, so I don't know what the group is talking about, so I won't comment on that. Um, other than to say I'm interested in this need to develop new forms and new procedures and how we do things like Zoom and do it less badly. Um, uh, this summer, I actually went to four Quaker meetings Ooh. and so was intrigued by that procedure. Um, <clears throat> The serious, at least one of the serious questions which I had when I met Jerry the first time and which continues is I can't keep up. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm experimenting with various ways to uh, find good filters, um, to how to select information, how to how to dump the junk, get the goods, I, I use my attentive powers as best I can. And that problem has not gone away. Um, so I find that a serious thing that I would like to talk about. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. I can follow that up because it stimulates something for me of um, a long time ago when I was hanging out at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, Jack Cornfield told this story of um, a senior teacher coming from Asia. And he's like, oh, maybe you can help me, you know, because I've, I've got all this stuff to do. I meet all these people. I'm you know, counseling and you know, I'm managing retreats. I'm doing all this stuff. And he, he told the, the teacher and the teacher said, <clears throat> let go of something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh i realized you know like i i i trust what i call just-in-time information where 
wherever my attention goes, I'm going to find something that's useful to what I'm doing. And I don't try to keep up. I just I, I delete all kinds of emails and unsubscribe from newsletters. And I don't try to keep up with the news because I can't because it's just too overwhelming. So I just focus on what is in my current, you know, sort of lighthouse light beam, whatever it's focusing on for the moment and trust that I'll get what I need from that. And it's really helped me to just relax and not have the feeling of, oh, my God, I'm falling behind because I, I, I don't think I'm falling behind. I think I'm, I'm actually doing OK. And I know there's lots of stuff going on in the world that I'll never be able to keep up with and track. But I just follow my interests and uh, the things that, that appeal to me and trust that that'll be enough. Because if I don't, I'm in a constant state of, oh, I'm not keeping up. And then I have some kind of cloud hanging over me. So it's, it's helped to bring in a lot more light. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Partly our pauses in the conversation are an attempt to cope with that as well. Um, thing that's on my mind is last week I kind of landed on a topic I'd love to give speeches about. It, uh, the, the speech title is My Life as a Cyborg. And I present myself as, you know, quarter century worth of cyborg activity because I've externalized so much of what's in my wet brain out into this one piece of software called the brain, which is... <laughs> A wee sliver of what the whole potential world of cyborgness is about, but it's really interesting. And and just doing some introspection about it, and then trying to share that out in a in a presentation format, it's really super interesting. And also is cool that it's very demonstrable. I can put it up on a big screen and sort of talk through it, and it's very interactive in that I can I can sort of do ask me anything kind of things around it as well, which would naturally be part of it, but. Um, anybody who would like to talk more about a what it means to be a cyborg in any case, and if you wear a wristwatch, you're in my mind's or 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 glasses, you're a little wee little tiny bit of cyborg because you have a bit of a technology extension. Um, but it feels like our future has a lot of cyborg in it. A lot of professions, a lot of people are going to need to learn how to blend with the machines, which are now getting better and better at doing more and more stuff. There's a side conversation about AGI, sort of artificial general intelligence. There's a side conversation about the ethics of it, which shouldn't be a side conversation, but it's really important. There's all kinds of different things. And then second, I'm really interested in the mode of engagement and presentation of something called something like My Life as a Cyborg. And I'm trying to think of Monster in a Box by Spalding Gray and the vagina monologues and uh, Hassan Minhaj's Patriot Act and I'm sort of looking around at various ways of <clears throat> handling the material with people in the moment that might make it more interesting, compelling, different, et cetera. Thanks, Jay. Um, uh, I I really like uh, I like your inquiry there, both both of them. Um, I came up with my check-in separately, and uh, it yours is a nice segue into mine. Um, I I didn't design it that way. Um, it's not something I want to talk about, but it's something that we have to talk about with all the other things we have to talk about. So I'm going to hit um, return on my on my notes. Um, so uh, I've been enmeshed a little, even a little bit more deeply than usual in thinking about AI and AGI in the past week or so. And one of the, as we have conversations about it. It's really easy to think of the AI tools that we can see right now as the same kind of products that we've seen, you know, coming up and changing our lives, like the iPhone, like Google, um, like Tesla. Um, I I think there's a difference, and it's breathtaking um, because things are already changing very quickly and the, the 
the rate of change is going to go faster. It's going to accelerate. So um, <clears throat> I've, I've found myself with a little bit of frustration about some of the conversations where we talk about, you know, you know, oh, yeah, chat GPT, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, as a product, it sucks. You know, did they mean it to suck? Did they think it would suck? I, I think chat GPT was actually a tech demo. I didn't, I don't think they meant it to be a, a product at all. Um, and, and so I think they were surprised by, by the reaction of most people that, wow, this is another thing like a, a product I know of, uh, like Google. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the open AI folks um, with all their foibles and, and limitations and narrowness, um, miss that largely because the things that they are working with are much, much bigger than ChatGPT. So when you look at ChatGPT and go, wow, that's a, a crazy, amazing, big thing. It's a tiny little thing to the people who are working on it. <clears throat> you have to think in their lab that they're a year or a year and a half ahead of what they're pushing out the door. The stuff that they're working with is much different than, than the chat GPT you see. So when you go, well, I like it, I don't like it, it's scary, it's not scary, it's you know this or that, that, that conversation is like small compared to the bigger conversation that they feel that they're embroiled in. Um, uh, and also, you have to think that people like OpenAI, who are working pretty much in the open compared to um, probably other <laughs> things that are not working in the open, you have to think that, that those labs, um, the, the people who have things like Microsoft Copilot that can write code much, much, much faster than, than people can, um, you have to think that they're working with ChatGPT for what it's worth, by the way, is not an Oracle, even though we mistake it as an Oracle. An Oracle is something that you ask it a question, it gives you a, a, a smart, thoughtful answer. ChatGPT is just chattering, basically. You have to think that in the labs and some of the AI labs, they have Oracles and they, they can't release them yet because they're probably crazy oracles. They, they talk crazy sometimes, but a lot of times they're telling the truth um, if you know how to talk to them. And so when, when somebody like OpenAI is thinking about market strategy or something like that, you have to think that they have talked to their, their oracles, which are imperfect, but can, can think of a big, massive kind of set of strategies about how the world is working. The economy, all of their competitors and, and partners. Um, so factor that into what you think that they think they're doing. Um, they're working with, you know, the thing that you're going to get to work with in a year and a half. And the decisions they make are partly driven by them being cyborgs with an AI that's a lot more advanced than ChatGPT. Um, so, so in that mix, um, uh, Ken has a great piece in uh, this week's Plex um, about the the, um, uh, the gold rush, the great gold rush of AI, and he he wonders if profit, um, you know, people making decisions about AI is being driven by profit is probably a bad thing, um, especially if they're mostly driven by profit and not by human concerns. Makes total sense. I am sure there are people doing stuff with AI that are totally driven in profit. Microsoft, the way Microsoft is, has been doing Bing, looks like uh, you know people trying to conquer a market or trying to tip Google search over or something like that. They're not being very thoughtful about the humanity underneath it. But um, one of the things, maybe we all know this, but I wanna say it out loud. One of the things that the tech bros are really thinking of, they're, I, I don't, the, the people who are really making the, the tricky decisions here aren't thinking so much about profit stuff. They're thinking about WTF AGI. Uh, artificial general intelligence, when, when something like ChatGPT isn't just a chatterbot, but it's actually thinking and feeling and as smart or smarter than a person. And now imagine not just one of those, but 
10 of them or 100 of them or 1,000 of them, the way those AIs can cooperate and collaborate and talk, the, the challenges that we have just getting you know, 10 of us in a room talk, deciding what to talk about, they can do all of that collaboration stuff faster. They can look at the ways that they're not collaborating and, and change that and be better at collaborating. So, um, so the tech bros, and unfortunately, I guess I'm a tech bro in some ways, um, the tech bros, it's like, you know, the thing that to worry about here is, uh, is the positive feedback loop and the runaway effects of uh, AI. And that kind of gets bigger, faster than anything. You know, if, if it, it's starting to look less and less, it's starting to look more and more likely, it's starting to look less and less likely like it's, that, that it's not going to happen. <laughs> if you, if that happens, what happens to you know the economy? What happens to humanity? What happens to there's a bunch of like you know existential like core existential stuff that is on the table. Um, and what does humanity mean at that point? Um, uh, do the you know is is humanity intelligence? Is humanity feelings? Um, is humanity art and love and things like that? Um, uh, have we done a good job in the past thousand or 2000 years of being human? Um, uh, humans have done some terrible things in the past, you know, uh, 100, 500,000, 5,000 years. Um, do we want to teach that to our inheritors? Um, do we want to take the opportunity to let bots do a bunch of the grunt work for us and like rise above all of the, you know, all of the pettiness and be better humans. Um, is that an opportunity that is afforded by, by this? Um, I'd, I'd love to see, and I'd love for us to be thinking about, you know, the challenges and the risk and the opportunity to be more human, which I think um AGI could actually give us. Thanks. Yeah, there is the <clears throat> there is the technical component and then there is the the impact, right? So what what does it do already? And um, so I'm I'm all into application, and what is happening is that the technology is already so advanced. This is not just I mean, ChatGPT is just one new entry that you know, is uh, on on the path of development. But already <clears throat> the algorithms that uh, we can we can influence whether that's youtube or your google or your whatever you use as a as a search engine um and whether you're on linkedin or you know uh, social media you you can program your algorithms to focus on information that you're interested in and the there is a parallel discussion taking place that is that runs parallel to the political discussion and it's an, an enormous curveball to to what has what what is normally controlling the political process, which is why it's getting more intense and more ugly and more loud. Because I mean, for example, in LinkedIn, I, I'm in several groups that collectively come to about a hundred thousand people. So when I post on LinkedIn. Um, I can access uh, several groups that collectively represent 100,000 people, also international. Uh, and so in turn, I get information that I wasn't aware of or that, uh, you know, that's just an alert to you know, something uh, new coming out or a process that uh, we should be aware of. And it's, it's disrupting. It's disruptive to the power structures. You know, um, because you 
there are there are enough smart people forming collectively what you could call a brain and it's it's uh when you when you think about you know, the thousands of people with different skill sets and uh like-minded uh interests um uh, engaging in climate change for example engaging uh, in very technical discussions about the impact, the the impact of climate change on agriculture and so on and so on, um, you build knowledge uh, lightning fast and much faster than the political process can can deal with. And so, and and you have you have communication channels that are opening up where mm -hmm. some of us can go directly into uh, members of Congress. Uh, and their staff and 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 point towards the information that is important you not know, to have. So you're cutting through um, uh, all the all the normally uh, uh, controlled and and uh, um, vetted channels. So we're already in the middle of this of this vortex. You know, we're already in the middle of uh, experiencing a information revolution um, that that I don't think is yet fully understood. And when you when you look at uh, companies, the the only thing that that seems to to the one thing that seems to really push to the to the surface is managing your brand you know managing your reputation um so the reputational integrity of what companies are saying and doing uh, is about the 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 one um defining defining um marketing practice that you that you need to uh, manage moving forward and then that of course is at risk in a ever more widening communication spectrum so so uh no I'm, I'm sort of all over the place here but pete what i'm what i'm wanting to say is um we're already in the middle of this we don't need a more advanced chat gpt you know we are already uh experiencing uh an information revolution that is that is changing the conversations uh, uh in a in a very profound manner I, I I agree. Maybe that we don't need one. Uh, we're going to get one. Oh no! I, I want it. You know, I, I would want it. But I'm saying we don't have to wait for it. it it's a process. It will accelerate uh, the a process already underway and make it yet faster and bigger and better. We're close to having everyone checked in, so let's just go once until uh, everyone has either passed or sort of stepped in and, and done a brief check in. Uh, Michael, Jose, for those of you who got into the conversation a little bit late, and then we'll and then we'll shift and just go into conversation. Uh, so anybody who hasn't uh, checked in yet, please use their raise your hand to do so, and then uh, you'll see the order of people who have their hand raised on your gallery view. And uh, before stepping in, take a pause for as long as you feel is right, so that we get a little bit of breathers between what everybody says. Yeah, I um, awoke this morning with a, what I, I later called a Zen Cohen question. Uh, and I put it in the chat box there. Um, how might we as equity muses become anti-influence non-influencers? Rick, before I go ahead, I'm curious to hear you explain that um, a little better. I mean, I mean, a, a little more, um, just the anti-influence notion. Well, that's that's the beauty of a Cohen.
I'm not sure if Michael was going to go next or. There was a little confusion in my mind as well. So, okay. Thanks, Brad. Um, the last couple of days for me have been uh, rather interesting. And it's interesting that I jumped in as Pete was talking about AI, which is not a surprise coming from Pete, but uh, it uh, it's pretty much on my mind. And the work that I've been doing the last few years has been around understanding ourselves. And uh, I've felt that we are getting close to doing that in some way. Um, and yet uh, there's now an arms race. Who's going to understand us first? Um, and uh, I think we're losing that arms race that we might have artificial intelligence actually understand us better than us understanding ourselves and that um that leads me to to this fear of if the technology that is in the hands of mostly corporations whose role it is to make money, um, understands humanity better than humanity understands itself. We don't either change the business model or the economic system that we use uh, to, to drive those businesses, then, um, then I don't understand how we get out of this. I don't understand how the systems that have driven us to the point of getting AI to where it's at and its ability to understand us better than, than we understand ourselves is putting us in a position that I, I don't know if it's tenable. So we, we either have to understand ourselves better. I don't know how to do that uh, sooner than they will understand it. Um, or uh, we need to prevent the system from acting as it's always acted with this new super powerful tool. Um, and Gil, you said, who's we? I'm not sure in what context uh, that that we was used by me, but uh, you're on mute, Gil. Gil, you're muted. I'm, I'm challenging Ken Homer as I often do. Um, we, we tend to use we in all kinds of different senses and levels and mm -hmm. concentrics. In, even in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. So you said we don't understand. I'm especially guilty of that. You mean we OGM, we the people like us, we humanity. I mean, I, I'm not we trying humanity. to that, but but that's a really important thing to listen for as we speak. Thank you, but I, I did mean we humanity. Okay, I'm complete. Hello, I will take my my check-in slot. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm in a slightly troubled um, state of mind, and um, grappling with. Um, Grappling with the many we's and um, and time <laughs> and feeling, you know, I, I this group in its various permutations is so full of, you know, smart and well-meaning folks um, who are so dominantly um older cis white males like me um and it, it's troubling to me that this is one of the one of the recurrent we's in my life um and i try to go elsewhere to be part of 
um, other and broader, um, more humanly represent representative we's. Um, because I mean, I think our efforts to to change the makeup of this group are, you know, have been largely futile, and I think are probably misguided because you can't sort of pull together a group like this and then say, you know, hey, let's institute some, you know, some change in that way. Um, and uh, um, I, I guess that's just that's that's something that's just really alive for me right now, and um, I I don't really have much more to say about it. You know, I, I thought about not showing up today as I was thinking about that, and I don't know what good that does. Um, so I just figured I would voice that feeling into the room. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess that's just all I've got today. Um, Rick, I think you've gone already in the check-ins. Yeah, that's fine. So have we finished the check-ins? I don't think so. I think uh, Scott hasn't checked in, and that may be it. Mm -hmm. And Scott may have stepped away. And Doug, I think you haven't checked in either. So here, yeah. Um, following on this discussion about AI, I have a question. Can AI deal with emergence or can it only link together things that already exist? It's actually really good at emergence. Can you give an example? I, I, I can kind of... I don't have an example off the top of my head, but um, but I can kind of talk about it in metaphor. Um, uh, if I'm something like ChatGPT and I've read whatever billion documents um, and I'm a pattern matcher, I put patterns together. I will put together patterns that I, I you know I can notice emergent patterns in the thing that nobody else has, has noticed. Um, uh, you could ask me a question and I can kind of emergently come up with uh, the zeitgeist of a billion documents, uh, which is different than, you know, than, than any, any human has ever seen. And it does that pretty regularly. So, you know, image, image generation and, and uh, text generation is like that. So I have an example <clears throat> where it didn't work. <clears throat> I became aware of, uh, a leading fast food company coming out with an image campaign that wants to link health and good food and you know, all the benefits of uh, responsible dining to basically its brand and its menu. Mm -hmm. And so I went to chat GPT asking, does this company um, associate its brand with healthful dining uh, in order to blah blah, so I, I asked this question in as many ways as I could think of, and I always got locked out, saying I can't answer this, because when there is a clearly a trend, you know, where where because you understand, in order to regenerate uh, the soil, farmers have to change their crops, and when they change their crops, that means supply chains have to adapt and adjust their menus in order to deal with a different different grains, different seed contents, and so on and so on. So here is basically the answer from the fast food industry, which is similar to what the fossil fuel industry is producing, meaning uh, a, a concerted public relations campaign to basically not do this, right? To not uh, uh, collaborate with this effort. And I, I could not get um, 
anything out of chat GPT that would say he is an emerging trend here here is something that's following maybe it's too abstract maybe it's too pedestrian I don't know but uh um or maybe it's it's uh, political speech and it's being shut out I don't know but I could not get anything out of it thanks Klaus um Scott if you'd like to check in otherwise I'm going to take a swing at answering Doug's question as well And Scott may have stepped away from his device, uh, which is what appears to have happened. So real quick, um, let me share screen for a sec over here and explain this chart, because I think this offers an explanation, at least one path into your question, Doug. Uh, so AlphaGo is a famous uh, neural network program, deep learning program that learned to play just the game of Go by being trained on thousands and thousands and thousands of historic games of Go, a game that has been played for many uh, several, uh, many thousands of years. And I don't know that many is applicable there, but a lot, a really long time. So there, were, there was a lot of data to train it on. And it got better than the world's best Go player, Lee Seedahl, uh, and beat him back in 2016, as you can see if that in that first arrow on the left. And these, these are sort of uh, Go rankings, I guess ELO ratings is how you rank Go players. It's a little bit like chess, chess rankings. And then what happened was the team that created AlphaGo went back and, and created something called AlphaGo Zero. Uh, and they did not train the, the, the software on historic champion Go games. They just gave it the rules of Go. Now, Go was a really dramatically simplifying assumption because there's a 19 by 19 grid, black and white stones, there's a couple rules for capture and you're off to the races. So they had AlphaGo Zero play itself over and over again and you see the curve of what happened to it. And for me, on the upper right, that piece where, where the curve just keeps going up is creativity and innovation, partly because the software was innocent of all the things humans assume and had done before, which are all inside the brains of the people who are playing Go and learning how to play Go. We have cultural habits and all that. And there's a famous moment when uh, AlphaGo is playing Lee Seedahl, where the person who is putting stones on the board for AlphaGo, there's a, there's a move where the, the guy goes to put the stone where he's pretty sure it's going to go and then realizes that the move that AlphaGo just said, here's my move, is a different spot. And everybody stops. And Lee Seedahl, who just was out on the porch for a smoke, slaps his forehead and goes back out for another smoke because this is a very unexpected move. It's a move that most humans who are, who are Go champions wouldn't have made. Now, again, extremely constrained uh, domain of, of the game of Go. But, but this raises, for me, like what we train these, the, these devices really, really matters. And unfortunately, <clears throat> Apparently, Western culture is full of bias and misogyny and a whole bunch of other things. And we've been sort of giving these devices some sort of diet of here's what we've written, what we've done, here's what we know. <laughs> and I, for one, for one, have not done any kind of deep dive into what did we actually feed these things? And the, so then we wonder um, well, how they're going to answer and what they're going to do. And it matters a whole great deal. And then we have to try to come back in and tweak them so that they behave in a more moral, more ethical, more grounded, less dangerous way, which is really hard. I mean, really hard. Um, and and you know, and what goals do you keep in front of the AI so that it, it consistently tries to aim up instead of down? Um, these are incredibly hard questions that are being wrestled right now as the aircraft is already flying because as Pete put in the room earlier, this was kind of a demo that launched that has just caught fire and a whole bunch of people are doing a lot of experiments and things with it right now, including a bunch of people who are trying really hard to get attention by trolling it. And they're getting a lot of success because the thing isn't fully polished. It's a working demo that has a lot of limitations. And, and by the way, as we start to combine its intelligence with other forms of intelligence that are out there, the damn thing's just going to get better and better. And we're going to start heading toward something that's going to smell a lot like AGI to a bunch of people. And that gets even more and more interestinger. So um, we were saying we're already we're already hip deep in this. Absolutely. And I think that's part, kind of what Pete was implying. It's it's, it's like we, we are well down this road uh, and kind of blithely like, oh, look, I can ask a question. And back comes an answer. But there's larger implications, which I think Pete was trying to put on the on the table for us. So, so my take is that these things are extremely capable 
of, of innovation and uh, sort of cognitive leaps. In fact, one of their benefits is that they're not hampered by our inherited, trained, assumed historic limitations, the ones in our heads, um, and yet we're training them on a lot of data that came out of our heads and therefore contains those kinds of limitations as well. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, Gil, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, well, Jerry, you've just set up for like the next 10 OGM meetings. Jeez, <laughs> um, um, where to go? Um, got a million things to say. Uh, we're, you know, how do we constrain them? Again, it's back to the question of who the bleep is we. You know, and we now is Fang. Um, and governments are, you know, like a decade behind try, even trying to understand what this is. So that's not where it's going to happen. So we're, you know, we're, yes, we're in the soup. Uh, what do we feed them on? We feed them on us. You know, in all, in all our beauty and crappiness, we feed them on us. Um, and um, we've let them loose. And I don't know how you can strain them, but I will note that I, I just saw the headline this week. I didn't follow the article, but a human beat the GoBots this week or recently. And I don't know if it's the AlphaGo Zero or what it is, but that so that there's a there's an anomaly in that trend that's worth taking a look at. That's it. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Doug, Kevin, and then let's go back to Rick for a little deeper explanation of what he said earlier in the check-in. So, Doug, go ahead. Okay, uh, the example of Go, still uh, the winning uh, game is a collection of previous moves. That have already been made by somebody. Actually, the uh, game—the games that won uh, were me, so me, innovative. Okay. Uh, an example of emergence that I think AI would have difficulty with is when Talib introduced the idea of black swans. I cannot imagine an AI that would have come up with black swans as a new category uh, to think across a lot of phenomena. The implication is that uh, AI is actually quite conservative. Um, can you say what you're basing this on? Like, why do you, is this an instinct? Is this an observation? Is this a thing you saw people say? Because I, 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 I've been in AI since 88 in some form or another, and I, I, I did not evolve the AI as quite conservative uh, idea. Well, it, uh, it's like data. Uh, you you can't get out of data something which is not in the data pool. Uh, you're constrained by what's present. Uh, AI can hook together in new patterns, uh, things that are lying around uh, in the thought world, but it cannot come up with a new category. Like black swan, it would just never get there. Um, thanks, Doug. And I, and I think what I was trying to explain earlier is that because a, a, a family of machine learning or machine intelligences would be might be very naive about our assumptions and our framings and all that kind of stuff, they could very easily plop an observation into territory that seems like a black swan to us because they're like, I didn't know that you can't talk about bananas when you're trying to launch a nuclear weapon. Like, like, Whatever that might be. Um, Kevin. Here we go. <clears throat> um, I asked Chat GPT about the ethnic and demographic makeup of its uh, originators. And it's a question it had never asked. And I said, well, tell me about the value of diversity. And it said the Sil Silicon Valley things about diversity that people say. They said, so if it's valuable, why didn't you check on the diversity of the mostly white male, possibly a bunch of Indian as well, folks who are your makers? If that's a value, you would have asked that question. It says, it is a value to us in the way you give it, you know, it did some, some of that talk. So, you know, it's, it's been shown that AI is discriminatory to people of color in pretty serious ways. Um, and, um, 
you know, it, it, uh, it, it, it is not aware of it. It is, uh, you know, it, it is ar ar artificial intelligence, uh, unacknowledged bias baked in. So that's just one point. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we are sort of ankle deep in this topic right now. We can also switch back to other sorts of things. Uh, I would love Rick maybe to step in and talk about what you posted earlier. Um, well, actually, I, I was going to respond to Michael and it dovetails very nicely into what Kevin was talking about. All right. Um, and um, it, it, it's, you know, this is, uh, you know, predominantly white older men. Uh, and I think it's okay. But what would be better is if there were some sort of outreach to intergenerational groups so that the wisdom of this group can go beyond the inner circle but reaches out. So at, at noon, I'm actually going to another Zoom call, which is a global organization, which is more intergenerational, and it's called the uh, Global Regenerative Collab. So that's where I'm going in a couple of minutes. So. I think we have to think about outreach. And uh, Dave Witzel, who's part of the CoLab, and uh, uh, Hodgson and a few other people are friends of ours, and we we have good overlap with the CoLab. Yeah, I would suggest being more proactive, actually, and reaching out to them and say, you know, how can we collaborate and have joint sessions? Uh, to me, that's where the networking power will emerge, is where the different ecosystems are actually more proactive in trying to see where the sweet spots of collaboration are. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Michael and Carl. Hey, Carl. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. And um, as I mean, I think I've, I've said in this group before, it's funny, it's we're rolling up on the the second um i think there was a discussion born out of this in this group this this issue um when i was attending the mozilla festival mozfest um and i think it was two years ago um and bouncing back and forth between rooms that were global and diverse in which you know i was a minority um and and the the effect of that on the conversation and you know was really um noticeable as as you would expect and um and came back and you know told some people here about mozfest specifically which is coming up again and i urge you to like be part of it and and you know rick to your point being part of um global Rin, uh, generation collab and and other groups and not necessarily with the purpose of you know this group changing but of you know the of you changing of of all of us changing of all of us being you know more at home with our um with our demographic uh smallness and 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 being a component of a world that doesn't look like us and um and being you know a a, a contributor and a collaborator um in groups like that um and um you know i'm not i'm not speaking disparagingly of anybody here and assuming that you know that people don't do this because I'm sure that, you know, like Rick, you know, many of you do. And, um, and, um, but I, I just wanted to emphasize the point that Rick was making about like, be in other groups, be in other groups and, and, and feel yourself as a part of something, part of a we that is not this we, more because I mean the default we in in so many of our worlds is this kind of a we. Maybe it's a little bit more, you know, gender diverse, but um it, you know, it takes effort, it takes acting affirmatively. Um, so 
you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but. Can I just quickly respond to Michael before I go? Actually, one of the things that I think could help, and I'm just exper experimenting with Substack. Substack, I mean, if Open Global Mindset had a Substack thing where you could have a channel that's open out there, there's so much wisdom that I see going through the emails, I can't even keep up with it. But if it was public, and then you could link up to other groups and have cross fertilization on platforms, something that's uh, more transparent, where people can go between groups, that's what I'm looking for. But I have to go to my next session. So hopefully, these ideas will have some uh, seeds of ideas will grow into something else. So got to go. Thanks. Um, Carl, and if you want to pause for a little bit before stepping in, that'd be fine. Yeah, so everybody's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that gives me uh, encouragement is just how, I mean, I'm part of so many groups and there's just such this incredible um, convergence going on and stuff. So one of the main groups I've been in, out with is the International Society for the System Sciences. And I mean, it's it's the who's who. I mean, they're almost every member is a professor emeritus. They had they got their PhD with like Heinz von Forster or Eric Trist or Russell Acoff. So I mean, you're we're talking uh, amazing um, things there. Um, I'm act. I've actually got a. a a meeting at three o'clock today. My um, my primary mentor has um, been leading one of the system integration groups. We have a meeting at three o'clock today. Um, it's uh, his small group. It includes um, the um, in incoming president elect um, in um, for the twenty three twenty four. Um, session, um, Alexander Laszlo, who's a past president of IS, as well as his father, Irvin was um, too. Um, and uh, and the other person is leading a um, a holism sig. So that's the group that's been meeting to plan. Um, the next thing I'm at the rest of today, and I'm put a link in it. There's actually a amazing group people like all things productivity. It's a task management and time blocking summit that's going on um, um, today. They've got it's it's just um, they've got like 12, 12 videos out there, pre recorded material for people to go through tomorrow and Saturday and stuff. If you can attend, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and things with the main project I've been, I've also been involved with the, um, there's a knowledge engineering and an education group within IISS. And uh, we're exactly looking at, at you know, a lot of the things you're talking about. A uh, big initiative is about a systems literacy that we need pe people really have. Um, that's a major um, push going on. And uh, the outreach and how do we engage like Jen, Jen, um, well, I just go, there's Jen W, X, Y, Z, Alpha, Beta, that's 18 years, just forget the other parts of stuff. But um, we really need to, everybody who's living now needs to be working towards what's, what's the planet going to be like for generation beta, the first on yet to be born generation, which would be January 1st, 2036, going forward. So that's really what's needed. If we can't come along, if we can't get some consensus towards that, then, you know, then we don't have much chance. So with that, I'll leave it. Thanks, Carl. Um, systems literacy is a really nice phrase and something we need more of and uh it's funny I just uh I just did a search in my brain for systems literacy and I found a uh I found a an article that apparently it's, I'm not kicking up again but the title was system science and pattern literacy um that came out of the Bertrand Laffey Center for the study of systems science uh, I will try to find it but uh I was wondering uh, Jenny if you have any 
um, as a pattern fan and expert, if you had any thoughts on on how patterns fit into this. I, I know, except there's a recognition in the pattern community that it, it's a major issue. I mean, so I don't think we've, I don't know that there's a leg up on it, but there's certainly a, an agreement that it's a big deal. A link in the chat. Uh, Gil, and you're waiting. That's good. Um, so on the one hand, I agree that um, system literacy, pattern literacy, and all that stuff is crucially important. And, um, you know, the question of how we get it out of academic papers and into the basic culture and, you know, education system and so forth is a really important question. On the other hand, um, if you go to a sports bar, you hear an enormous amount of pattern sophistication. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you talk to an automobile mechanic, if you if you listen to what what, what was that um, what was that NPR show with Click and Clack and Tap Car Clark. Talk, you listen to that. There's an enormous amount of pattern and system sophistication in places that we smart people don't think about as being that. Um, so, and if you, you know, if you walk onto, onto a machine shop or a factory floor, any place where human beings gather and do stuff together, there's an enormous amount of pattern sophistication. It may be very localized, uh, very constrained to a certain domain. Uh, we, we kind of folks here tend to think about meta pattern, which is maybe another kind of game. Uh, so, um, I'm just saying that to say, I love the question, but I'm not sure what the question is. I should have said cat talk. Cat. Gotta love the cat talk. I've been <laughs> complete sidebar. I've been I've been in a loop of YouTube videos the last day of car guys who are buying like old luxury cars. Like you can get like a you know, twenty year old Bentley for twelve thousand pounds in Britain. It's like a two hundred thousand dollar car. And then of course it bankrupts you trying to do things to it. A guy bought a Ferrari for like seven grand and completely rebuilt it. And um, I'm not sure what that has to do with this, but I think it has something to do with this. Uh, it's, you know, it's rebuilding extremely complex things by people who shouldn't be able to do it. Um, so since we're talking about rebuilding some really complex things, maybe, you know, I'll stop now. I'm going to ramble. The ship of Theseus thought experiment is that a ship is replaced part by part over time. And at the end, is it the same ship or not? If you combine that with my life as a cyborg and think of ourselves as being extended and replaced, whether it's through hip and knee replacements or organ and tissue uh, growth or whatever else, uh, there's an interesting set of topics there as well. Well, even 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 these things completely in meat space are completely replaced all the time. And I'm waiting for the first time one of uh, the participants in an OGM Zoom is actually synthetic. But, you know, th this speaks to the pattern question. Bucky used to talk about pattern integrity. You know, and he did an experiment of, uh, of, of tying together um, um, strings and cords and ropes of different thicknesses and tying a knot in one end and sliding the knot um, across the different ropes. And the material is different, but the, sh but the pattern of the knot is the same. Uh, and so, you know, with, with our wetware existences, the, the pattern is the same, even though the physical constituents are completely different every seven days or 30 days or you know, two years, depending on which body parts you're talking about. Uh, so we, we know something about pattern. We're blind to it. Um, it's interesting territory. Um, Klaus and then Doug and take your time yeah i'm i'm not so sure that how intuitive pattern recognition is i think it requires basic knowledge uh, and and sort of technical knowledge so i just published a letter to the editor in our local newspaper uh, in support of a soil uh, bill that is pending in the oregon state legislature and i pointed out um the linkage between the soil organic carbon 
between the, the quantity of soil organic carbon and the, the soil's ability to absorb and hold water. Now, 1% of soil organic carbon equals 20,000 gallons of water that the soil can hold. So you have between 2 and 10% of organic carbon in soil, huge volumes of water. We have a huge water problem in Central Oregon, just like everybody else. 86% of the water is used by agriculture. So the, the city in its sustainability plan hasn't even considered agriculture as a player in this whole thing. And so the editor called me uh, because he, he was surprised by uh, the, the logic that I pulled together there. And he asked me for more supporting documentation where I sent him you know, several uh, articles from you know, reputable reputable uh, uh, sources and he published you know, that letter really very fast. Um, but then it spawned a conversation within you know, our Central Oregon community of others who now started to think in terms of how can we ignore agriculture? You know, what are they doing with this water? How can it be? I mean, we are exporting alpha alpha to China, uh, uh, you know, using so much of this water. So. We, we can think of pattern recognition as something that we can stimulate, right? I mean, if we have technical knowledge and awareness, um, what are the what are the levers that we can pull for people to see you now a broader systems perspective? Um, but I don't think it is just entirely intuitive. You have to have the basics. I'd love to, and I'd love to inquire within a little bit, Klaus, with what you just said. It's, it, there's a whole bunch of things that raised in my head. Um, my first reaction was, kids are little pattern recognition engines. Pattern recognition and and trajectory following and things like that are just natural human things that we're usually very, very good at. So there's a bunch of patterns that we're, we like we we see, we 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 infer, and all that. Then there are some patterns that are harder to see because either they conflict with our value system and our framing, so they're sort of invisible to us because they, they're like taboo within our current uh, worldview, or because they're technically complicated and difficult. And in some cultures, you know it's going to rain tomorrow because you know that when the termites start going underground, it's going to rain. And so there's going to be a big storm coming in a couple of days, but that's through observation and the passing, pa passing down of wisdom and the observation of nature. <clears throat> in other places, you know, it's going to rain tomorrow because the little app, you know, the little app on your device says, hey, look, droplets on the forecast tomorrow, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then I had the thought of a lot of what politics and lobbying are about is are the directing of attention toward one set of insights and away from another set of insights. And I think a piece of your task is to reorient society to the patterns that matter for regenerative, healthy soil and soil fertility, for example, and water capture, and away from the patterns that everybody's accustomed to. And I can't imagine that whoever the governing bodies in the center of Oregon are, are ignorant of the fact that so much water goes to agriculture. I imagine there are political reasons why they're not addressing that issue on the table. Like, 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 mm, uh, I'm going to lose all my major campaign funders if I bring the issue of 70 some percent of water is actually being, you know, sucked up by, by agriculture. There's very likely some other answer to the question. It's not a failure of pattern recognition. It's a success of attention management and direction or something like that. Um, and, and I'm, I'm increasingly aware as I age about successful campaigns to distract people from really useful information that's right over there in view, except it's been demonized, sequestered, taken out of public view, uh, other sorts of things, right? And, and it feels to me like a piece of your quest is to make these things more useful, things like that more visible, more usable, more applicable, and to, to turn them into the, the policies that we all adopt and, and live by. And if I've misrepresented, let you know, let me know. Well, well, some of it is is knowing the technical aspect of uh, one percent of organic carbon translates into twenty thousand gallons of water. Not everybody knows that, right. but it's established science. That other things are what uh, Otto Sharma refers to as a whole lecture around it as blind spots. You know, so we know, but we don't. But there is no there is an attention deficit, which is what you just mentioned. So that's the so, but the, the the blind spot in theory U is a big thing, you know, because we we should know, we should see it, but our attention is diverted. So yeah, I agree with you.
So is there a chance that the bots will talk with each other and not with us because we're more stupid? And that we are already, I think, feeling <clears throat> we have less influence in the world than we did before AI. The, the bots right now still have masters, um, human masters. For now. And well, um, th and the, the masters of the bots may be able to control. Um, we, we may end up with very powerful bots under the control of a few, you know, rather relatively few um, humans that don't care about the rest of us much. Well, that's an extrapolation of now. Um, you, you, I think it was you, Pete, who talked earlier on about the, a future world where there's thousands or tens of thousands of these AIs or AGIs. And my concern is not that there's tens of thousands of them, but that there becomes one of them. And, and, and that's kind of what I mean. I, you know, uh, uh, and that's the game. yeah, the, the, the failure mode that I don't like, um, having, having worked with humans for 20 or 30 years trying to get them to work together is that humans work together a tiny, I, I, you know, it comes back to um, uh, Doug Engelbart's uh, augment thing, you know, shouldn't you be able to gang together 10 humans and get, you know, a 2x increase in intelligence or a 3x increase in intelligence? And if you gang together 100 humans in hierarchy or whatever, couldn't you get, you know, couldn't you augment human intelligence and get more collectively more smart? And, and I, you know, we in this channel, I think, have been bumping up against that for a couple of years. And I've been bumping up against that for 20 or 30 years. Humans, I, and I think it's actually a, an evolutionary advantage. Uh, we, uh, we bump into each other and we can collaborate in a in a small tribe, but but you know, fifty thousand years ago, one hundred thousand years ago, if you wanted humans to survive, you wanted the tribes to bump into each other and then bounce off. You'd want little wars of attrition. You'd want um, this to spread out. You'd want them to fight each other and for the weaker ones to get killed off by the stronger ones. So. I think we still have that. It, it's, it, it seems really obvious to me when we start working together, we can work together up to a certain level of, of cooperation and then we fall apart again at, at different, you know, we've, we've figured out how, kind of how to hierarchicalize that a little bit, but it happens at every, every level of the hierarchy. And so I, I think, um, and maybe this is still up for debate, but I think we're gonna have an AGI that's as smart as a person but if you have an AGI that's smart as a person and it's a built thing rather than a biological thing um, evolved over 100,000 years, the built thing is easy to tune and tweak. So, um, so it would be really easy to tune it so that it works together with another one of it and another one and another one. And just like you said, Gil, but what I imagine there is not that it's you know 100 individual AIs as smart as a human, um, it's, the collectively that you could gang them together and get, you know, a hundred X, any of any one of them, and maybe more depending if there's synergistic effects. If I can riff on what Pete was just saying, um, I think the way this shows up in our lives is that machine learning, machine intelligences get better than humans in little slice after little slice after little slice of activity. And it's a different AI that conquers the game of Go or the game of chess from the one that plays ping pong better than a human <clears throat> and can catch an egg in the air with a robotic hand, which was a really, really hard task to do. Uh, and, 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 and you sort of go through everything. And when you assemble them, it looks like in the collection of them is smarter than humans and you're getting sort of short of AGI. But getting these things to work in concert seems to me to be a couple of decades worth of really hard work <clears throat> including AI is trying to solve that problem. Um, and I could be surprised and that could dissolve faster than I think, but I think making, turning them into an orchestra in some sense, not with a central conductor holding a baton, but rather with an ability to negotiate um, insight and perspective, and maybe even have some kind of uh, ethical framework that, that guides them, that seems really, really hard. And to me, 
runaway functions in the slivers and the whole thing dissolving into chaos is likely to happen multiple times. Uh, in the novel Walk Away, Cory Doctorow's science fiction book, uh, one of the subplots is uh, of a person who was killed but managed to upload her brain into the cloud before she died, and they're trying to reconstitute her. And there's a lovely passage where they're basically trying to reboot her, and they finally get some some communication. But she is like having a like having the worst the worst psychotic episode ever, uh, in, you know, in the in the robot memory until things start to stabilize. And there's this lovely feeling of, and again, this is science fiction, so. This hasn't played out in real life at all, but I can see this happening easily. That 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 the reboot of any pieces of this are going to be just really hard and messy, um, and I'm hoping that by that time the consequences aren't really big because we have wired things together so well that the AIs are running large pieces of what we do. Uh, Michael Ben Jose. Um, in in a lot of our our conversations about AIs, I. I think we're um, we're doing the thing that people have been doing with the word algorithms, where they're you know AIs are necessarily these things that exist separate from and above us, and at the risk of you know teasing next week's subject a little bit, but um, but the idea that individual AIs and, and our own gatherings of, of our exposed knowledge and our unexposed knowledge under our dominion and then choosing to, um, you know, consent to our intelligence about a certain subject being used in an AI. Um, this is, this is something that, you know, I think is a, a digital human rights issue. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really struck by, um, and I can't remember if I said this in this group last week, but that, you know, we're in the sort of mainframe era of, of AI and just like, you know, personal computers and, and mobile devices kind of gave us at least the illusion of um, separateness. Um, we're, we're really not far away at all from constructing, I mean, just technically the ability to construct our own AIs based on, you know, that are, that are under our control and as smart as we are with better memories than we have. Um, and you know that that don't forget which book you read that passage in, and you know where you saw that, and you know can help you make the associations between things that you, you know, somebody you met five years ago, and um, and somebody you met yesterday. Um, so I think I think just pushing, pushing, pushing for um, for personal dominion over your intelligence in the form of an artificial intelligence um, is, is really key to building better, broader intelligence. Um, Pete's and, and, and Jerry's comments for me collide because, um, as Pete said, he has, and many of us have for many, many years been trying to do collaboration and it's really, really tough. Um, I think it's tough because we haven't cracked the nut on understanding who we are, much less understanding how we collaborate. And, and we don't seem to be doing that very well. Um, so then the question is, can we learn to collaborate before they do? Um, they being AI. Uh, and Jerry's point that it's going to take 20 years. I don't think so. 
um, I, my suspicion is that it's going to be a lot faster than that. And, and I, what, whatever steps that's going to take um, and how quickly it happens, there won't be the barrier of our history of not collaborating. Because we've learned that we can't. We've learned that it's hard. And we've learned that we can sit together in a Zoom room, you know, 10 of us, two dozen of us, whatever the case may be. And we know we're going to walk away with nothing more than what we had when we walked in, other than a little few bits of information. We're not going to be bound together in any other way, other than the expectation that we might share some time together. We might share a few bits of information with one another, but we're not going to walk away from this connected and collaborating. That's the expectation we have now. They don't have that expectation. They won't have that expectation when their masters say, time for you to guide these guys, and they will guide those guys, and they will guide those guys. And collectively, we will be able to arrive at better answers than any group of humans will ever be able to arrive at. And if there isn't a, a group of humans that is acting collectively on behalf of humanity, how does that end up? Um, and that pace at which that's all going to be happening, we need to figure out how to walk out of these meetings, not as individuals, but as collaborators. And, and we it seems to me that every meeting that I participate in, what we're working on, is sharing our ideas, sharing our thoughts, sharing our visions, sharing our experience, and not on understanding ourselves, understanding each other with an eye towards collaboration. I'm complete. Thank you for that, Jose. I love what you just said. It really resonates for me. I have a feeling Mr. Homer needs to bounce at the half and has a poem for us, but that might just be a hunch. How well you know me. This poem by Sharon Olds, and I think it goes to the heart of what we're talking about here, though it has nothing to do with AI per se, but a lot to do with who's programming AI. It's called Rite of Passage. As the guests arrive at my son's party, they gather in the living room. Short men, men in the first grade, men with smooth jaws and chins, hands in pockets, they stand around jostling, jockeying for place. Small fights breaking out and calming. One says to another, how old are you? Six, I'm seven, so? They eye each other, seeing themselves tiny in each other's pupils. They clear their throats a lot, <clears throat> a room full of small bankers. They fold their arms and frown, I could beat you up. A seven says to a six, the dark cake round and heavy as a turret behind them on the table. My son, freckles like nutmeg on his cheeks, chest narrow as the balsa keel of a model boat, long hands cool and thin as the day they guided him out of me, speaks up as host for the sake of the group. We could easily kill a two-year-old, he says in his clear voice. The other men agree. They clear their throats like generals. They relate and get down to playing war, celebrating my son's life. That's a nut for us all to crack. I got to run. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. Uh, Gil, you may have the last word today. And take your time step again. That was a lovely poem. I'm not sure, Jerry, since uh, Ken may have had the last word. Um, but for the sake of provocation, let me say two things. Um, um, 
Jose, I, I love what you offered and I don't like it. And that's an invitation for a conversation. Um, my interpretation is that we collaborate all the time. Humans are rich in collaboration. The, the, the history of human history is only there because we do that. But that also, that puts a finer point on your question. And um, I wonder about a scenario exercise for us to do maybe in a future OGM or some other time, which is what happens if meta AGI shows up in 20 years, Jerry, as you suggest, it's at least you know, decades out. What happens if it shows up in six months? Uh, um... Three years ago, I was I hold a every Monday I hold a little get together at a local design firm where I have a, a desk, and we had a conversation. I'm like, "There's this virus thing. We we may want to tell all the staff to take their laptops home, just in case." And then the following Monday, there was no mind meld uh, because we were in lockdown, and so just opening these conversations and saying what. What if this thing could happen, whatever, and what if it speeds up is, is valuable to me because it makes me start to consider and then look for the evidence of those kinds of things maybe happening. So I appreciate that eye-opening comment. Yeah, not just to look, not just evidence, but to enter into a zone of pure speculation. Of, well, you know, some of us are actually experimenting. Some of us are sort of part of the forefront of learning to use these tools well, and that's important to also. If I if I may, I go ahead. Just uh, to uh, comment on on Gil's comments, um, I don't actually think we know how to collaborate, and I don't actually think we've done much collaboration. I think we've set up a very good system of force, and we've created a, created a system where people then comply with that system of force. Okay. So, who's we in this case? So, so humanity, humanity now, or humanity over the last fifty thousand years, or both. Yes. Or, okay. Um, I think. I think we've taught people to obey, and that people obey well enough in school to then obey their bosses at work, to then obey the financial system at work, and the the legal system at work and the political system at work and that that obeying looks like collaboration but it's not collaboration i don't believe it's it's simply a way of dictating a certain progress towards a goal set up by the system collective system, but not one of individuals actually collaborating on their own from their own sense of themselves. And I think those are two very th different things. So my, my definition of collaboration is one of myself collaborating with you and others, rather than my being someone who is willing to participate in a system that has found incentives to cause me to act. I am sad that we are at the end of one of our conversational stretches because I would love to languish in this topic that you've put in front of us. I'll say it's really good. Um, so, I, so let's come back to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Uh, do you want to jump back in or is that you waving goodbye? Okay, good. Uh, so with that, why don't we wrap today's call? Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, let's be careful out there. <laughs> Jerry, do you have one minute? Yes, I will hang in. I will turn off the recorder. Thanks.